everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fossil Friday Chats. I'm Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. Joining me as always is Gabriel Santos. Hi everybody. I'm Gabe Santos from the ALF Museum, patiently waiting for the Falcon and Winter Soldier to spring. <laughs> He's had so much patience. He's just sitting there waiting. And uh, joining us today for today's Fossil Friday chat presentation is our good friend, Advit Chukar. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Britt. Hey, Gabe. I, I, I'm hey. doing, yeah, it's finally warm in Connecticut, and that makes me very happy. That's so good. <laughs> like, it's been cold coming. here. Yeah, it's been cold here a little bit, but like now that, you know, things are starting to go, we're all going in the garden, enjoying things, so... Pretty soon we'll be able to go out and social distance and enjoy the sun more. I mean, California cold is nothing like Connecticut cold. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's fair. fair. That's, that's fair. I'll take that. Fair. And as a child of the tropics, I do not do well when there is a three-foot layer of snow outside <laughs> the parking lot. I wouldn't know what to do with that, honestly. I have no idea. Yeah, as a Californian, I am attracted to snow. I find it lovely, but I have no concept of what it means to actually be in snow. No, it's just that beautiful white stuff falling outside. I don't have to go out in it. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm well, I'm well aware I don't have the proper uh, uh, perspective on snow. It's it's nice when it falls. It's a pain when you have to shovel your your car out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh I'm well. Not into that. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody. So, as always, uh, if you have questions for Dr. Chukar after his presentation on Survivor India, go ahead and put them in the chat. We will get to as many as, as we are able uh, after his presentation during the Q&A portion of our presentation today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on Dr. Chukar. He is a vertebrate paleontologist broadly interested in the ecology, evolution, and biogeography as terrestrial vertebrates. His recent research focuses on mammalian and dinosaur herb herbivores, which means I'm very excited for this talk, systematics of South Asian mammals, and megafaunal extinctions. He's currently a Gaylord Donnelly postdoctoral associate at the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies and Department of Anthropology, and a research associate at the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of Natural History. So I'm always excited for anything that has to do with megafauna and proboscideans, and I can't imagine why. <laughs> Who can say? I have no idea. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, like uh, Britt introduced me, uh, my name is Advait Zucker. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the survivors uh, of the megafaunal extinction and the, and the megafaunal extinction itself in a largely forgotten part of the world called the Indian subcontinent. Now, India is quite a remarkable place because today, if you went into the forests and grasslands of India, you, you, you would still see lots of large animals like, like, the, like giant cattle, like the gaur, Indian wild buffalo, uh, large antelope like the nilgai or the blue bull. Uh, large deer like the sambar, wild ass uh, in northwest India, Indian rhinos, which are, I think, the largest species of rhinos alive uh, today, large elephants, and of course, uh, the famous Bengal tiger and lions. India has lions as well. But what do we know about India's past? What do we know about its extinct uh, species and, and, and about the extinctions that took place not that long ago? Well, it turns out for the longest time, we had no idea what was going on in the subcontinent. But before I get started um, talking about extinct megafauna and this extinction, let us uh, let me situate you in space and time. I'm going to be talking about the Quaternary period, which uh, is the last bit of, of the Cenozoic or the Age of Mammals. And it consists of two epochs. You have the Pleistocene and the Holocene. We live in the Holocene right about here. And I'm going to be focusing on the last 50,000 years, which is the last bit of the Pleistocene and all of the Holocene. You've probably heard of the Ice Age and about how the Pleistocene is called the Ice Age, but there were actually several um, glacial and interglacial cycles. The typical Ice Age that you might see in films like, like Ice Age refers to the last glacial uh, period before we get uh, to, the, to the interglacial called the Holocene, which is where we live. Like I said, 
several glacial uh, periods punctuated by warm interglacial in the Pleistocene. And these uh, climatic fluctuations get more intense as you move through time from about two and a half million years to the present. The interglacial world looked pretty much like uh, what our world looks like today, but in, in a glacial period, there was so much ice trapped up in these continental ice sheets in the northern hemisphere in North America and, and Europe that sea le levels were substantially lower. You had a vast plain which went out about 200 miles up the coast of North America. Sri Lanka was connected to, to mainland India, and there was a giant plain uh, connecting most of the islands of Southeast Asia called the called the, the, the Sunda Plain, and Australia was connected to, to New Guinea. So world somewhat similar, but uh, a lot more land in glacial uh, times. And if you went back 50,000 years ago, you would actually see large mammals everywhere. Today, the distribution of large mammals looks something like this, where you have large species, mostly in parts of Africa and South and Southeast Asia. And there are very, very few large species left in parts of Western Europe, North America, and South America. But if you're walking uh, in, in Pleistocene, California, you would probably see mammoths and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and horses. Down in South America, you had animals like glyptodons, which are these giant armadillo-like animals. Um, you had giant ground sloths, Toxodon through these strange, uh, almost rhino-like animals without a horn, and relatives of elephants. Uh, Australia had some of the strangest megafauna. You had giant wombat-like diprotodon and the marsupial lion called Phylacoleo. Northern Eurasia had woolly mammoths, woolly rhino, giant cave bear, and giant deer called the Irish elk. Even Africa had species which are no longer found on the continent, like the longhorn uh, buffalo Sanceris antiquus and the strange wildebeest Rusing gorix. Southeast Asia had animals like the giant tapir and the long tusked stegodons. And even oceanic islands had megafauna. You had giant ground slots in the Caribbean. You had giant birds like the moa and the elephant bird uh, on New Zealand and Madagascar. And Madagascar even had a human-sized lemur. But if you take a close look at this map, you'll notice that there's a giant blank spot in the middle, which is where South Asia is. And, and we had, and, and in over four, uh, four decades of megafaunal extinction research, we didn't quite know what was going on in this region. We didn't know why there were so many large mammals left. We, we didn't know if there were any extinct species or not. This extinction is particularly strange because large species preferentially go extinct. Uh, this is a, a curious feature of the last 50,000 years when only large mammals seem to be at risk of extinction. And these extinctions don't take place at the same time. There is no one, uh, one megafaunal extinction event, but it's actually protracted over the last 50,000 years with some of these extinctions uh, taking place between about 50 and 40,000 years in Australia, followed by extinctions in northern parts of, 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 of Eurasia. For the continental extinctions, uh, the Americas were hit the latest, um, and the oceanic islands were actually hit in the last about 1,000 years uh, of the Holocene. What's curious, though, is that these extinctions all take place after the arrival of humans, and they uh, vary considerably in magnitude with places like Australia and the Americas getting hit the hardest uh, with, with losses of somewhere between 74 and 85 percent of, of their large mammals. But again, we don't know what's going on in the subcontinent and how it fits in with this global pattern. So what do we know about late Pleistocene animals in India? Well, the first uh, late Pleistocene mammals were, were found by British ex explorers. So we have to go back in time to the 1800s when the British East India Company was uh, governing large parts of the Indian subcontinent. What you're seeing here in pink uh, is, is places where the company was in power. The first fossils uh, were found by Hugh Falconer up in the Sabalic Hills, and he found fossils that were from the early Pleistocene and from the Pliocene and, and published them 
in the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, which was then a, a scholarly society based in Calcutta. And James Princip, the then secretary, was so interested in these fossils that he wanted to know about uh, fossils from the rest of, of the subcontinent. So he puts out an ad in the journal, and this ad was answered by a, a colonial doctor named G.G. Spilsbury, who lived in central India in what was then called the, the, the Narmada territory. And so he starts uh, going down the, the Narmada River from the town of Jabalpur in the north through, through the towns of, of Narsingpur and Hoshangabad and starts finding lots of fossils. And he finds so many of them that when he starts to draw geological maps uh, of his explorations, he actually lists where these fossils were, were found on the map. So here you can see that a fossil horse was, was found uh, up north here near uh, Bailatri Hut, and fossil bones and fossil ele elephants were found further down on the course of, of a tributary to the Narmada. Some of these fossils were used by local Indians as tools of the trade. This is the, the palate uh, of a large species of elephant and the third molar which was used as a washing stone uh, by a local Indian washerman. And this was uh, taken from him and it eventually uh, found its way to Calcutta, uh, to the Asiatic Society. From there, all of these fossils were taken to the Indian Museum in Calcutta and to the Natural History Museum in London, where they were cataloged and described by Hugh Falkner. And from this collection, he identified 16 species which uh, they thought at the time were extinct from post-tertiary deposits in the subcontinent. Post-tertiary basically means the last uh, two and a half million years or so. Excavations uh, were halted for about 50 years after that and they were taken up again by, by Robert Foote who was looking for evidence of early humans in India and he goes down to South India to a system of caves called the Bilasurgam Caves in, 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 the, in the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh and finds this enormous cache of fossils that were then described by, by, by Richard Lidecker. And this was the first time that we started to see evidence of smaller species like primates, small carnivores, uh, lots of, 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 of rodents uh, and, and pangolins. And off this uh, assemblage, that, that they described from the caves, there were about nine species that they thought went extinct in the Indian subcontinent. Since then, excavations have been fairly sporadic. Indian archeologists have gone and explored much of central India in search of stone tools and evidence of early hominin occupation. And in these uh, early explorations, they found new species of stegodon. They described new species of hippo. Uh, cave bear and species of, of uh, buffalo. And more recently, uh, colleagues of mine from, from Yale described uh, a, a species of water buck from the Western Indian state of Gujarat, which is presumably from, from the latest part of the Pleistocene. But all of these are sort of individual fossil discoveries and, and no one had synthesized all of this to look at patterns of, of faunal change through time. The first paper to actually systematically look at patterns of faunal change uh, was this study that was conducted by scientists from the Max Planck in Germany, where they went and re-excavated the, the Bilasurgam caves in South India. And they actually showed that these caves had deposits going back to about 200,000 years. And what they found was quite remarkable, is that in the last 200,000 years in this one part of India, there were next to no e extinctions. They found one species, Theropithecus gelata, which is probably the same species of gelata that you find in East Africa uh, today, which goes extinct sometime uh, between 74,000 years and, uh, and 125,000 years ago. So a lot of uh, continuity suggesting that maybe India didn't have a lot of extinctions. However, I knew about a lot of these older fossils that were found and colleagues of mine and I managed to uh, directly date the first specimen of, of Indian hippos. Um, and what, what, what we found was, was very interesting is that these 
hippos actually persisted on up into the earliest part of the Holocene, suggesting that there were actually more extinct species in the subcontinent. So I asked this uh, question, what about all of these other uh, animals which had been described in the recent past? Do all of them also go extinct in the last 50,000 years, which would suggest that India experienced a more widespread extinction? Well, to do this, I generated a, a list of all of these extinct species, and I, and I went through them and got as much age information as I could and looked at their taxonomy, which is how species are named, um, and then determined which of these species actually lived in the last 50,000 years. Now, a lot of these animals had poor age control, which means we don't actually know if they were from the last 50,000 years years or not, which is when these extinctions took place for white. Some of these species had been synonymized with other extinct species or with living species. For instance, Cyanocephalus was synonymized with Arapithecus, Equus paleonis was synonymized with Equus nematicus, so these are not valid species anymore. And a lot of species were described from insufficient material. What this means is that the, the, the specimens or the fossils that these uh, species were described from were either crushed or too fragmentary for these fossils to be taxonomically informative. They just weren't good enough uh, to justify a new species. So I excluded all of these problematic animals which had been named, and that gave me a list of five species which I knew for sure went extinct in the last 50,000 years. And they included two species of proboscidean, which are elephants and their relatives, Paleoloxodon, Nematicus, and, and, and Stegodon. You had an extinct Indian species of wild cattle called Bos Nematicus. Hexaprotodon, which is the Indian uh, hippo, which I think is really cool that India had hippos, and Equus Nematicus, which is a zebra-like horse. So Paleoloxodon, Nematicus, was one of the largest species of proboscidean or elephant relatives to have ever lived. Um, modern day Asian uh, elephant males weigh about five to six tons. African elephant males weigh somewhere between seven to eight tons. Paleoloxodon weighed about 12 to 14 tons, which is heavier than the weight of the big Colombian mammoths, which lived in North America. This was a truly giant animal. And that's, one of his skulls, which is housed in Calcutta and me for scale, I'm about six feet tall, so you can just get a sense of how big some of these elephants truly were. Stegodon nematicus is this underappreciated uh, group of elephants called stegodons, and they're called roof-toothed elephants because their teeth have these almost roof-like cusps. Um, and some of their, their tusks were enormous. Uh, specimens from, from the Sibalix are, are, are known to have tusks that are about 12 to 14 feet in length. This was a fairly rare species from the Indian record, mostly known from fragmentary teeth, but not that long ago, colleagues of mine uh, from, from, a, from, a, from a university in India found a partial skeleton of the stegodon from, from central India, which is quite cool. And now we can learn more about their, their, their anatomy and their paleobiology. Equus nematicus is something that I call the Indian zebra. And I call this a zebra because of certain structures on their teeth. Now, modern day horses includes your domestic horse, uh, zebra and, and, and donkeys and wild asses. Zebras and donkeys and wild asses are called stenonine horses. And this is because on their lower teeth, they have a loop of enamel, which is V-shaped. Whereas your modern domestic horse and the wild Shavalsky horses in, in Mongolia have a U-shaped enamel loop on their lower teeth, and they're, they're called cabaline horses. This horse from the Indian subcontinent had this characteristic V-shaped loop, which suggests that it was a stenonine horse, which includes animals like zebra. The Indian hippos were these terrifying, toothy monsters. Uh, they're called hexaprotodon because their lower jaw had six incisors. Now, there are two species of hexaprotodon that have been described from these late Pleistocene deposits. There's hexaprotodon nematicus and hexaprotodon paleoindicus. The only way to distinguish them is by looking at the size and position of the lower incisors. 
in relation to the size of the first and third incisors. In nematicus, the second incisor is about half the size of the first and third incisor, whereas in paleoindicus, it's less than a third to a, to a quarter of the size of, of, of the other two incisors, and sometimes they're highly elevated. Unless you find this part of the jaw of these hippos, it's almost impossible to tell the two species apart. And that's why I call all hexaperidon from the late Pleistocene hexaperidon spa because it's hard to know which species we're actually dealing with, but we know that these hippos were there for sure. Bose nematicus doesn't represent a true e extinction because this species of wild cattle was domesticated in the Indian subcontinent after about 9,000 years. Um, and they survive today in the form of the modern zebu cattle or the humped uh, cattle, which you find in, commonly in India and now in parts of South America and Africa. Interestingly, I also found evidence of ostriches from these late Pleistocene sites. Uh, they were mostly represented by ostrich eggshell beads and chunks of the eggshell that were etched uh, and probably used for ornamental purposes. One of the characteristics of this megafaunal extinction is that there's a large size bias. That means large species preferentially go extinct. How do these Indian extinctions compare with the rest of, of these extinctions that we see uh, elsewhere? Do we also see a large size bias? That means are the extinct species on average larger than the species that survived? And to do this, I estimated the weight of these extinct animals using a existing equations that correlate the weight of a living species to certain skeletal characteristics, like the size of the limb bones or the size of the teeth. It's fairly easy to use teeth uh, to estimate the size of extinct rhinos or extinct horses or cattle. It's a lot harder to do that for extinct elephants, but the way to do it is by using uh, measurements like the shoulder height or the length and the width of the long bones. Turns out if you don't have these skeletal parts, it's kind of hard to get at the weight of these extinct elephants. So I developed a new method to correlate the occipital condyles, which are two, two of the nubs at the back of your skull, which attach your skull to the vertebral column, to the size of the limb bones. And so then using the skulls of these animals that were found in India, I could estimate how big the limb bones were. And then using these estimated limb bone sizes, I could then figure out how much these extinct elephants weighed. And then I created what's called a frequency distribution of the body weights of these extinct species. And I compared the frequency distribution of the body weight of the, of the extinct species, which is that down here in gray, to the body weight of the species that survived. And it turns out that the extinct species on average are heavier than the species that's, that survived. As you can see, they're all fairly big. Paleoloxodon weighed about 14 tons. Stegodon weighed about six tons. The hippos were about a ton and a half and the, and the horses weighed about 500 uh, kilograms. And these extinctions represent the loss of about 4% of the land living non-volant mammals. What this means is that we're only considering mammals that live on land and, and, and mammals that don't fly. And about 15% of the mammals weighing more than 50 uh, kilograms, which is a commonly used cutoff for megafauna. So we know that these extinctions take place, that they're megafaunal, and, they, and that these species lived in the last 50,000 years. But when exactly in the last 50,000 years do these species go extinct? To figure this out, I looked at 52 dated sites within the last 50,000 years. And from these sites, 24 sites contain extinct, uh, the five extinct species that I uh, talked about. And using these dates, I constructed an extinction chronology. What you're basically seeing here is a scatter of the various dates associated with the different extinct species. Now, we know that the fossil record is incomplete. That means you will never ever find the last individual of a species. And a species can't be declared extinct until the last known individual goes extinct. So how do we figure out when a species truly went extinct when we never find the last known individual? Well, you can estimate this using various statistical approaches, which looks at the distribution of the various dates available for these species, and then forecasts 
when that species would have gone extinct based on the density of the dates that you see. And that's precisely what I did and what you're going to see here in, uh, as, as the blue dots and the blue lines. I couldn't do this for Stegodon because you need more than five dates to estimate these extinction times. And I chose not to do this for the species of wild uh, cattle because they survive today in their domesticated form. The first extinctions, if the last appearance of Stegodon represents a true extinction, is at about 30,000 years. Followed by the extinction of horses and Paleoloxodon sometime in the latest part of the Pleistocene, between about 20,000 years and 15,000 years. And the ostrich and the hippo persist just into the earliest part of the Holocene and go extinct sometime around 8,000 years ago. The last appearance of these wild cattle shows up at around 5,000 years, and they actually overlap with the domesticated forms for about 5,000 years. So what this gives us is an extinction window of about 22,000 years, which starts off probably sometime after 30,000 years and continues on to about 8,000 years ago. So that's our frame of reference for when these extinctions take place. And now we can start to understand what else is going on in the Indian subcontinent to try and figure out what may have caused the extinction. So again, let's focus on this extinction window. And we know that uh, there have been uh, that there have been lots of climate changes uh, taking place in the Indian subcontinent at this time. And climate change has been implicated in the extinction of, of megafauna el elsewhere. And just focusing on this extinction interval, we see that there are three periods of time that are particularly cold and dry. They correlate with the last glacial maximum, which is the maximum extent of Northern Hemisphere ice sheets. Heinrich event one up here, which is a particularly cold and dry period in the subcontinent characterized by mega drought. So lots of rivers dried up, lakes dried up. It was a harsh, dry time. Followed by the younger driest, which was a cold snap that we typically see in parts of the Americas, but was also characterized by low monsoons. The curve here that you're seeing on the left is a Greenland ice core record, which is a proxy for global temperature. And the curve on the right here is a proxy for the Indian monsoon that's, that's derived from uh, cave uh, stalactites and stalactites from Northeast India. You've got weak monsoons on the right and strong monsoons on the left, cold temperatures on the right and warm temperatures on the left. What's interesting to note though, is that all of these species seem to persist through other intervals of quite rapid climatic fluctuations when you do see alternating wet and dry periods. And, they, and while they go extinct in these, uh, in this uh, period characterized by fluctuating uh, cold and dry uh, periods, there isn't a very good correlation between what's going on climatically and the extinctions. What about humans? We know that hu humans have been implicated in the extinctions worldwide. Uh, globally, the extinctions followed the arrival of humans on the continents. So let's see what people are doing. Based on on genetics, archaeological evidence, and fossil evidence, we know that people have been in the Indian subcontinent for at least 60,000 years. And this extinction interval, interestingly, corresponds with the transition in the tools that people were using. Older uh, tools are fairly large, whereas these younger tools, uh, which are called microliths, start showing up in the record at about 45,000 years. Uh, and they and they and they continue on up until the very recent. And these small tools are typically used as projectile points. And so what I think is going on here is that these extinctions seem to correlate with a period of time when humans are getting more sophisticated in their in their hunting technology. We're also seeing a corresponding increase in the human population. The dark blue part here shows the relative population of, of, of humans in the Indian subcontinent. Between about 40,000 years and 20,000 years, South and Southeast Asia had about a third of the world's population of Homo sapiens. Interestingly, though, there's a long time lag between the arrival of humans and the extinction. So the extinctions seem to correlate with increasing human populations and changes in tool technology. We can conclude that while the extinction was 
highly size biased, it's fairly low magnitude. You don't lose a lot of species. And it takes place several thousand years after the arrival of Homo sapiens, which is a curious uh, pattern, not something that we see elsewhere on the planet. It seems to coincide with fluctuating patterns of rainfall and increases in human populations and technological change. So if we plot this extinction with the other extinctions that we see around the world, a curious pattern emerges. It fits the, uh, the pattern that we see whereby the extinctions follow the arrival of Homo sapiens. But unlike other parts of the world, like the Americas and Australia, you don't actually lose a lot of species. You only lose about 15% of the large species in the Indian subcontinent, which is very similar to the pattern seen in parts of Africa where our species evolved. So what's causing this? What's causing a lot of these megafauna to survive? What are they outwitting, outplaying, and outlasting? Well, it seems like these species may have co-evolved with other species of hominids. What this basically means is that other species of early humans were in the Indian subcontinent for a lot longer and the ancestors of the modern day megafauna or even those species would have adapted to whatever humans are doing on the landscape. We actually have a lot of evidence for early humans in the Indian subcontinent. We have a fossil of an early human from perhaps the middle Pleistocene of central India. We actually have a lot of stone tools and almost continuous record of stone tools going back to almost two million years, suggesting that one or more species were there in the Indian subcontinent from at least two million years to the present. And this suggests that a lot of these species of megafauna, which survived, may have learned to live alongside our species. It's also possible that humans were going after smaller prey. Now, this evidence only comes from one site in South India, from a rainforest site, oh, not from, from, from South India, but from Sri Lanka. But it seems like people there were going after smaller prey. So maybe humans in the subcontinent after a point went after smaller prey after the extinction of these large species. We need more evidence to, to verify this, but it, it, it's a tantalizing clue to what's going on in this part of the world. It's also possible that the animals which survived had strong metapopulation networks. We know that an animal's probability of surviving an extinction increases if it is more widespread. And a lot of large mammals in India, like the modern day uh, Asian elephant, Indian rhinos, uh, gaur, and water buffalo were actually fairly widespread until not that long ago. And some, like the elephant, range from Turkey all the way into southern parts of China and Southeast Asia. So it's possible that even smaller extinctions in the subcontinent would have been buffered by populations from the rest of, of, of its range coming in to rescue the species, whereas the species which go extinct in the subcontinent were all restricted to parts of India. They, 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 they weren't found anywhere else. It's also possible that these animals had access to more, more refugia. What you're seeing on the left here is, is a map of the vegetation types that we would expect in India during a typical glacial maximum. And what you're seeing is that you've got a lot of tropical savanna and woodland grassland mosaic going through the subcontinent, but you also have rainforests and tropical uh, woodlands and, and, and grasslands, much like what you still find in the subcontinent today. So a lot of the ecosystems that we find there today were, were still uh, present in these, in these uh, glacial times. So, so these animals probably had uh, an increased chance of surviving in these refugia and probably were more resilient to going e extinct because of this. And now we have a lot of corroborating evidence for these low magnitude extinctions in parts of South and Southeast Asia as well a new paper that was published in Nature in uh, 2020 also showed very, very few extinctions taking place in the last 50,000 years in environments that were largely similar to environments that are seen uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So, so this, this, this pattern of survival, of outwitting and outplaying humans there, and of dealing with 
the environmental changes that we see seems to be a common pattern to animals that, that lived in South and Southeast Asia and animals that had adapted uh, to the presence of not just our species, but various species of, of, of humans through time. So why should we care about these extinctions that took place a long time ago? And that brings me to something that Alfred Russell Wallace said in 1876. He said that we live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest, fiercest, and strangest forms have recently disappeared. And Wallace was talking about the extinction of megafauna, of, of all of these large charismatic animals from across the world. And we know that these animals still survive in these pockets in the Indian subcontinent and in Africa because they were very good at dealing with the, 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 the pressures of, of early humans uh, on, 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 on the continents there and with the kinds of environmental changes that were taking place. However, the exact same pressures that these animals may have been more resilient to have now accelerated at unprecedented rates. We know that habitat fragmentation is taking place at faster and faster rates, which means that these metapopulation networks that may have allowed these species to survive uh, the megafaunal extinction are now starting to erode away and are, is making these species less and less resilient to new forms of change. We know that hunting pressure from, from, from humans has accelerated at, 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 at at an, at an enormous pace with population declines of large mammals across the world. And if we're not careful, if we let the existing megafauna go the way of these extinct species, the largest land mammal on earth might just be a cow. And I'd rather live in a world where we still have large species like elephants and rhinos and buffalo and deer. With that, I'd like to thank the Western Science Center and the ALF Museum for, for hosting me uh, for this fossil of Friday chat. I'd like to acknowledge all of my co-authors that made this research possible and the institutions that supported me. And now you can look at a picture of me staring longingly at one of these extinct proboscideans and ask me any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Advit. So, that was great. Yeah, that was such an amazing story. I it's those are the stories I love to hear. I mean, for one, it's like one of those things that being, you know, being in America, you don't get to learn too much about the natural history in other parts of the world. And also, as you know, as humans, we like to kind of separate ourselves from nature. You know, we always talk about like we go into nature, but really the story you just told is that one of those things where you show how a part of nature humans actually are, how much we affect the world around us. And, you know, our survival has affected other things through time. And it's, it's it was just so fascinating and like um, perspective changing to hear. No, absolutely. And, and it, it gives us a lot of messages for why animals survive, right? You know, if you've got a large range, you, you do just fine in these human dominated environments and, and animals can't do that today, right? Because they're all living on islands in a sea of, of humanity. And if we, if we, if we keep doing what we're, we're doing, they're going to go the way of the mammoth, which is quite sad. Absolutely. And I think it, and I think it's important too, because it shows like, at least part of the reason why we study paleontology, you know, we can look at extinctions in the past and try to um, prepare and prevent extinctions in the future. So I think, you know, sometimes it's like, well, why are you going out into the desert to dig up, to dig up bones? You know, what, what does that matter for, uh, for today? And I think this talk was a exemplary, um, example of that. Yeah, I agree. I agree oh, too ahead. that I don't want cows to be no. the only megafauna no. left. Heck no. I love cows, but I love elephants more. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know, like, we're megafauna, and, and if they go, we're going to be in a world with, like, cows and people as the largest things. It's kind of sad. Yeah, no thank you. Yeah, yeah. but it, 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 it is quite a remarkable story of, of survival, because we just don't lose that much there. I mean, even, like, a number, like, 15% is not that big when you consider everything that's actually survived 
in South and Southeast Asia. And if, if you start looking at, at Eurasia as a whole, the extinctions are actually fairly low in magnitude when you compare the Americas or Australia, suggesting that you know, these animals, given enough time, can adapt to whatever humans are doing on the landscape. Good, good lesson to know about. Especially like, because you, like you said in your talk, there's that kind of thing where you see humans arrive, but there's a lag in yep. in the extinctions and that's fascinating to see that to see them like co evolving and co-adapting to our presence and like um you don't see that that's not a story that we hear especially here in north america i think the north american story has been sort of bogged down in this in this idea of blitzkrieg it was this idea that was proposed by paul martin back in the day to explain this rapid extinction but i think a lot of paleoecologists and paleontologists have moved well, well away from the Blitzkrieg hypothesis. We now know that humans have been around in the Americas for a lot longer than just Clovis people in the last 12,000 years. Uh, we know that these animals probably survived a lot later than we actually think they, they survived based purely on the last appearance dates. So I think we're going to start seeing longer and longer lags. And I think that's because it takes humans some time to get to a certain population size where they actually start to affect these species. Uh, we're not killing everything off. You know, we're not going and hunting off every last individual. That's not what overkill is all about. It's just, it's enough hunting pressure on these slow reproducing species, which are living in these fragmented populations to get the fertility rate from two to 1.9 and then a population collapses. We don't have to kill everything. You kill just enough babies of mammoths and then they're gone. Ooh, so sad. Yeah, I mean, uh, like uh, uh, proboscideans have a very long gestation period. El like elephants stay pregnant for about two years and it takes about six to seven years before they give birth again. So it takes a long time for these populations to actually rebound from some of these uh, stressors. And a lot of large mammals won't breed uh, when population sizes uh, drop to a certain point or when environmental conditions are harsh. So it's all sort of come together. But what I would argue is that while climate change was necessary in a lot of these extinctions, it's not sufficient to explain all of them. You, you need people to explain this strange pattern that we see around the world. Yeah, one, a very, very important thing to, to take home for a lot of folks is that we have a part to play in so much of these recent extinctions mm -hmm. and changes. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and this biodiversity crisis that we're, that we're experiencing now, you know, we're talking about the sixth extinction. This started 50,000 years ago with the extinction of, of these mega beasts. All righty. All right, if anybody has any uh, questions for Dr. Jakar, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will get to as many as we are able. Um, this question is from our frequent viewer, Mermaid Labs. How much does geology factor in to the extended survival? Is that bundled into the refu uh, refugia benefit? Um, that, that's a hard, well, I'm gonna interpret that as topographical variation. You know, so if you have a lot of mountains, there's a lot of, uh, in uh, valleys and more more refugia there. We have some amount of topographic complexity in central India, but it seems like a lot of these refugia were in the northeast of India or in Sri Lanka. It seems like warmer and wetter parts in the glacial uh, periods tended to have more, more uh, diversity and then these animals would expand out. Molecular studies on the Asian elephant has shown that in harsher uh, times, populations would, would retreat to Southeast Asia or Northeast India and down to Sri Lanka, and then they would come back out. So it seems like wherever you have geological complexity, which is creating more of these refugia, you've got a higher chance of species survive. Let's see. Um, this is from uh, Lucas. Uh, he says, I saw E... Hysodrichus on the chart of viable species. Is the partiality or lack of info on the animal a result of location? So Elephas hysodrichus was one of the species that was that was listed as a potential species that was extinct now. Elephas hysodrichus was first described by Hugh Falconer from the early Pleistocene of the Sibolix. Based on the fossil record, uh, from the from the Sibolix, we know that it, it lasts from about 2.7 million years 
to maybe half a million years ago. So far, I have not seen any convincing evidence of Hysodricus molars in central India. The reason all of this confusion started is because in, in the Natural History Museum in, 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 in London, there is one specimen of, of a lower molar that's been attributed to Eliphas Hysodricus from, from central India, from these post-tertiary deposits. And when, when Falkner went to describe it, he was like, the preservation and, and, the, and the, the sediments around this doesn't look like what we typically see from central India. So even he was suspicious of that, 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 that one specimen. Fossils were traded quite a bit by the British back then, so it's quite possible that someone had it from elsewhere and just kind of came in to the collection from, from central India. Now, we do have deposits from the middle Pleistocene. Uh, they're not as well dated, so it's possible that Hysodricus was there, but it definitely wasn't there in the last 50,000 years. Any Hysodricus or supposedly Hysodricus molars that I've seen from that last uh, chunk of time are just worn down Elephas Maximus molars. Alrighty. Let's see. Here's another good question from Mermaid Labs uh, saying, I've heard you talk about uh, longer megafauna survival in places where there were multiple hominin species. Is the implication the idea that the different hominin species went after different prey? Uh, it's unclear what these different hominins are doing, but as predators, humans are strange because we, we tend to uh, be more dense uh, on, in, in terms of our numbers on the landscape. If you look at a typical predator like a lion or a tiger, they don't necessarily modify their environments as much as humans do. We, we tend to be great niche constructors. We tend to burn landscapes. We tend to clear out uh, patches of vegetation. So I think as a predator, we're doing something fundamentally different from what typical big cats or bears or, or dogs are, are, are doing. I think early hominins may not have been as sophisticated or as efficient at hunting so whatever little pressure that was that was exerted by them on, on the fauna allowed these fauna to either avoid these these early hominins or kind of deal with uh, where people live and maybe change their uh, a a activity patterns. So when Homo sapiens come in and they're and they're exhibiting some of these similar behaviors, these these animals know what to do when hominins are are on the landscape. I think this is our most hard-hitting question, so I hope you're ready. Um, this is from Bailey. Uh, if you could choose any megafauna, living or extinct, to be your pet or animal companion, what animal would you choose? Now, we'll <laughs> sit here for an hour as you deliberate, because um, I know yeah. this is a difficult question. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, it's probably going to be the Asian elephant. I love elephants. Uh, I love elephant evolution. And I got a chance to meet uh, the elephants at the National Zoo in Washington, uh, D.C. And now I'm best friends with Swarna, <gasps> one of the African elf, uh, the uh, female Asian elephants there. It was a lot of fun. I'm not that is so cool. with envy. I'm fine. <laughs> How many people get to say their BFFs with a with an elephant? That is so freaking cool! Like, you've, you've only ach achieved my absolute dream in life. It's fine. <laughs> what was it about elephants in the first place that like really drew you to them? Like, to as a scientist, not just as a scientist, but like before you became a scientist. Uh, before I was a scientist, when I was a kid, I was always fascinated with the natural world, and I think uh, I just liked them because they were big. I think. I think a lot of kids like megafauna and dinosaurs because they're because they're big and they're kind of weird, which is why I, I I like them. But scientifically, I sort of got into them by accident. I was working on these symbolic ecosystems and I was trying to understand how patterns of body size changes through time. And I was trying to and we have a lot of extinct elephants there, but I, I couldn't quite get at their body size because we don't have a good way of estimating the size of extinct elephants. And so I was developing this new technique. And I was just amazed by the diversity of different elephants that were out there and kind of got hooked. Yeah, nice. purely by accident, because I was studying 
a part of the world and a fauna that includes a lot of them and trying to solve a problem that regarded them. And I was like, all right, well, we have all these elephants. How many of them are valid? There are lots of taxonomic problems. And I just sort of went down a rabbit hole or an elephant hole and trying to figure <laughs> I mean, that's how it works in science. You're working on something somebody gives you. All of a sudden, you're like, wow, these are amazing. I'm going to spend most of my life being fascinated on these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a pain studying them because they are so big. Yeah. <laughs> all the, all the whale people out there are like, yep. Yeah, no. Yeah, like yeah. all the sauropod people and the whale people and the elephant people can kind of commiserate. Like, I, mean, like, I, huh. I, 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 I've used calipers that are eight feet long just to measure some of these bones. <laughs> I didn't even know those exist. <laughs> yeah, you, you have these anthropometers and you kind of assemble them. And they're typically used by medical professionals to measure people. But you can use a caliper to, to measure pretty much anything. Could be an elephant. I, I kind of want one of those now, just, just for oh, the I heck want of one. it. <laughs> um, earlier in your presentation, you had this really cool story about... Um, someone had, had was using the the molar as a washing stone mm -hmm. um are there more stories like that that you've come across um for those for these fossils that's the only one that i've come across there are actually very few stories about about what local indians were doing with the fossils and how they thought about them um this is the only one that i could come across where it was sort of used in someone's daily trade we know that other fossils in the subcontinent are used for religious uh, purposes. Uh, some of these symbolic fossils were found uh, because when these British explorers went to the hills, they, they visited the princely state of Nahan, and the king there presented them with this, with this tooth from a stegodon, saying that this was the tooth of a god. And a lot of the hill uh, uh, people uh, there think thought of these uh, fragments of bones as 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 relics of of, of various gods. I'm, I'm not sure if that belief system has continued on into today, um, but at least back then, that's how they they came across these bone beds. I think the earliest reference to fossils in India comes from from uh, this Islamic historian named named Firshta was uh, talking about how. The army of Feroz Shah was going through the Sivaliks and they were digging a mound and they found these giant bones uh, of, of presumably extinct uh, giants which lived there. They are probably just chunks of elephant skeletons that they found because you find, find a lot of them there. Well, I love those kind of stories where like where science and culture like really collide, um, you know, within science as a paleontologist, you know, we we're very focused all the time just on the bones and explaining what they are. But those stories and the, you know, the, the history that comes along with the fossils are so important, especially when we're trying to have people connect to the fossils that were found in like their own country and things like that. Okay. All right. We have one last quick question. Um, so this will be the last one for the day. Um, just from uh, Mermaid Labs again. So how much field work's going on in India right now? Like how is that, um, uh, how is that progressing? So I can probably count the number of vertebrate paleontologists in India on both hands, uh, which should just go to show that there isn't a lot of field work being done. I think um, there are probably a couple of people who are actively involved in the field. A colleague of mine is currently in Western India picking up older uh, fossils from the Neogene. Uh, there are archaeologists who go out, but paleontology really hasn't progressed in India as a discipline. Um, it was pretty uh, popular. I mean, we, we have an Institute of Paleosciences and paleontology was popularized by the Sahani family uh, back in the in the 60s and 70s. And Ashok Sahani is like the grand old man of, of Indian paleontology. And his academic offspring have done most of the work there. But we don't have a lot of students who take up uh, paleo in India. Uh, we don't have a lot of faculty who do uh, academic paleontology. And part of that is because of the lack of opportunities in, in the field. Paleontology seems to be a luxury good, you know, and for people in India who need to make a living, it, it's a big risk to go into a field with, with so few job opportunities. 
Yeah, it's very similar in the Philippines as well. You know, I can count the number of Filipino paleontologists in both the U.S. and the Philippines on just, again, both my hands. And it's it's just something that you're not aware of because it's not, like you said, it's kind of a luxury to be able to choose to be a paleontologist. Um, but, you know, hopefully as, you know, w more people come to the field, you know, people like you can inspire folks to really try to set up these kind of programs or inspire folks to go into them. Yeah, yeah, and, and I just just hope that Indian institutions put their weight be, be behind this, like like the Chinese have done. And China has now emerged as this powerhouse in paleontology, and 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 at, at least for China, they view it as a national pride that we have some of the best fossils in the world, and and fossils that that rival any, any, anything that that's found in, in the West. And when the symbolic fossil deposits were found, the Geological Society of London christened it, I think, one of the greatest fossil finds ever for its time. We, 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 we have an almost continuous record of mammals that goes back 18 million years. And India has so many highlights from, from, from paleontology because early whale evolution takes place there, as you know well, Gabe. Uh, we've got Indricotheres, which are some of the largest land mammals have ever lived in the subcontinent. Cambathers, which are the earliest relatives of horses and rhinos, were found in India. So there, there's a lot of interesting ev ev evolution going on and, and a lot of key s specimens there which tell us about the story of life on Earth. I think Indians need to view this with a sense of pride that, that the subcontinent can actually contribute uh, quite a bit to our understanding of the story of life on Earth. Oh, definitely. Every every fossil is worth a thousand stories, and India has tons of fossils to complete those stories and fill in the gaps that we have elsewhere. So let's hope that more folks get to see your episode today and hopefully get inspired to go out there and work on them. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, if I uh, Thank you for all of your good questions. Uh, if anybody is looking for something to do tomorrow um, on Saturday, Gabe, I believe the ALF Museum has an event tomorrow. That we do. Tomorrow is our first Discovery Day online. It's a event we're having called Making Monsters Art and Science. We'll be in, uh, inviting a bunch of really, really amazing and talented science illustrators and creature designers uh, to join us on YouTube to talk about their careers, um, answer questions to any future paleo artists. And we're ending the day in a special panel called uh, Careers in Science Illustration, where you can meet all of the previous ALF Museum Science Illustration interns and kind of learn how it takes to get into the field. And for me in particular, at 1130, I am very, very excited because I get to meet and talk with a uh, famed science illustrator and creature designer, Tara Whitlatch, who happened to be the creature designer for Star Wars Episode One and the creator of Jar Jar Binks. So my nerdy butt is going to be very, very excited and trying not to freak out at Been meeting talking about it all person. week, everyone. I have. I'm very sorry, Brittany. It's okay. I understand. <laughs> um, but yeah, that all starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. on our YouTube channel, which you should be watching right now. So hopefully some of you will, will see some of you there. Uh, I guess that does it for our episode today. Um, if people want to learn more about your work, where can they go um, to to find more and or talk to you about stuff? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at amzucker. Uh, that that's my most active social media uh, profile. Or you can go to my website about zucker at weebly to learn more about my research. Awesome, thanks. Um, if you and we'll put all those in the description below and thank you so much for joining us and thanks everybody else for joining us on today's episode if you love this program and want to support programs like it at the alf museum and the western science center you can find links on how to do that below and of course please subscribe and like to our, and please subscribe to our channel for more stories from the world of paleontology uh we will see you all next week bye everybody Thanks.